There is another way to try to solve the problem. Eventually, it might seem, at first, simpler and almost automatic. I'm not saying it's better or worse, just different. It depends on the object you're trying to model. In this case, it's possible to do something here using the technique I'm about to show. Once again, I'll use this form tool. I'll even delete the last T-spline created. And it's precisely in this case that the amount and density of triangles in the mesh are in fact important. And you'll understand why shortly. Theoretically, what I'm going to do is the following. First, I'll create a plane slightly above the part. And on this plane, which is essentially a surface, this will be subdivided. And then I'll ask the software to automatically snap it to the geometry of the part. In other words, it will take those points that are all on the same plane and move them so they coincide with the scanned mesh. There are parts where this works exceptionally well and others where it doesn't work at all, especially parts with steep slopes. Because the points make large jumps and may not align perfectly. In other words, significant distortions might appear compared to the original mesh. In this case, I believe it will work well. I haven't tested it yet, but let's do that now. If I try to do this on this plane, it won't be a good idea. It's too far from the area I want to translate, which is this one here on top. Therefore, I think the first step will be to create a plane near the area, either slightly above or below. Both will work. It's important that the plane is close to the area you're planning to translate. This plane seems good. I think we're ready to use the form tool. In this case, it won't be the face command, but rather the plane command. We can then create the plane based on this type of rectangle, starting in one corner. Yes, I think this makes more sense in this case. Something like this should work. We can even try to cover almost the entire area we want. Now, we have the following situation here you can define the number of subdivisions directly in this window. And the more subdivisions you have, the better the command we'll see next will translate the surface. However, when you add too much geometry, if you keep increasing to very high values, remember that processing will also become more complicated as we've mentioned a few times. I'll try to set a value that I think is reasonable. This seems too much, perhaps around here or maybe here, Yes, maybe this is enough. Four might be ideal for now, and on the other side, also four. Let's go with this setup and see what happens. On second thought, I'll increase it to five. Let's accept that. And now we're left with this geometry, which doesn't seem complicated. What I usually do, and keep in mind this depends on the part's context, is remove the faces I believe are unnecessary. Notice that I'll need to create that contour manually over there. You might ask, why am I doing this? Because it might not make much sense to you yet. I created a plane with so many faces and now I'm deleting them. Why? Because in reality, I'm preparing the setup to define the edge contour of the part. With the initial rectangular geometry, I couldn't do it. I'm trying to move away all the faces that might overlap in that area. I think this way it looks good. Let's just activate Alt plus one here to view the geometry in box mode. See what it was and what it became. However, nothing stops you now from doing what we've done previously, which is pulling some geometry. I won't do it now because that's not the goal. What I will do is explain how the command works, obviously. Let's switch this to shader mode and use a command found in the modify menu. Look for a command called pull what does this command do? When you select it, it immediately snaps to the geometry. Of course, points that are far away create this problem where they are pulled into areas I didn't want. This happens because the pull is done relative to the nearest point along the orthogonal direction of the plane. Since this is the first attempt, it's normal for things not to go perfectly. I have to admit, I don't like rehearsing my tutorials because only then do situations arise that simulate a more realistic environment. Let's try another way to improve this situation. Recapping, what was I trying to do? 
I was trying to do too much at once, and that's a common mistake. Trying to do a lot with little. That's not always a good idea. Let's reduce the complexity by creating a smaller area, as you can see being done here. We can even move away from that zone. That seems like a great idea. This situation here, even at this stage, I'll adjust by slightly manipulating so that this point doesn't snap to the geometry directly below. That being said, I can simply do this and I think we'll get a much better result this way. Let's move forward, modify, followed by pull. And that's it. This is really how it works. Trial and error until the result is satisfactory. In this case, the final result is far superior to the manually created situation from the previous video example. It required much less work. Now, we just need to fetch the elements that will define the perimeter edge of the model. Look, these points seem great. I'll now activate smoothing again using Alt plus 3. And, as you can see, it translated the surface very well. What do we usually do right after this? We try to capture as many uniform surfaces as possible that can be translated with the pull command. Given that the topology is very tidy, we can now try to create something to bridge this geometry here. You'll see it's not particularly complicated. Now we start using other tools, and once again, I keep saying that having multiple options is always the best approach. Some might say the ideal is to simplify, reduce the number of tools, fewer commands. The argument is that it makes the software simpler and more accessible. And that's true, but on the other hand, it introduces limitations on what you can do. From my experience, when one tool doesn't work, I try another and another, and eventually I always manage to achieve what I want without significant detours. So, it's always preferable to have more options to work with, at least in this case. It's almost like a workshop. One with few tools and another with many. Which one would you prefer? Let's look at how quickly we managed to do this compared to the previous situation. Notice that in the previous case, we had some topological issues where there were areas that didn't close correctly requiring new geometry to be created. There were also faces generating triangles. In this case, that's not happening. Why? Because we have a very robust base. It doesn't mean we'll be able to do everything with what we currently have in terms of geometry. Of course not. We are reaching a relatively critical area. So I won't try to go all the way down immediately. I'll try to create an intermediate element here and another one there always trying to maintain the topology, aiming for something similar to a rectangle. It doesn't need to be exactly the same. In the lower area, we'll try to create smaller elements because a higher level of detail will obviously be required. However, I don't think it will make the tighter curve perfectly. Look at this one here, right? It's already far from what would be ideal. Nevertheless, it has four sides, but we can manipulate this better, obviously. Now don't be misled, this is what I said at the beginning. In this case, it was better to do it this way, but it's not always like this, okay? Let's close it and test it just to see how it looks when I apply the smoothing algorithm. It's not excellent, but it's not bad either. Remember, this is a much faster generation technique and in this case, better than the previous one. I still wanna show a third situation. I'm just trying to analyze here. We might briefly hide the main body. Once again, apply symmetry using the mirror duplication. Let's select the created shape and the symmetry plane, followed by OK. Notice the separated bodies, which is perfectly normal. Now we'll run the weld command again. With the symmetrical vertices, it pulls the points to the middle, exactly as happened in the previous example. Let's check it. I think it's fine although I have some doubts about what happened here. I don't like this aspect. This is definitely a triangle, but let's see. Let's apply Alt plus one. And in fact, it is. In other words, we could have improved this a bit to avoid generating a triangle. But for this demonstration, it's actually advantageous that these situations arise. 
This here can obviously be adjusted. This situation here, notice that it's generating a sharp edge here as well, but it can be rounded. How can we do that? Simply drag this point. As you do, try to understand how the surface reacts and, based on that, you can improve where it could go. Now let's select it and manipulate it a bit here. But notice, it will indeed generate a more uniform transition, but at what cost? Creating a shape very similar to a triangle. After this analysis, I conclude that it will be necessary to subdivide this area even more to have more elements to achieve the desired shape. Let's finish the form command, Fusion will jump to the surface workspace. And this situation here, I'll now show it in its entirety. Notice that it generated some surfaces, and interestingly, the surfaces ended up with inverted normals. That's not a problem. It just means that if you apply a texture, it will only appear on the beige side, the lighter one. The mustard colored area will then be the back of the surface. In this area, the texture won't be visible. Either way, this is easy to fix. Just run the reverse normals command. Not that this has any implication, it doesn't. What I want you to notice is the area where the triangles are at the front. Notice the complexity generated. Whenever the complexity of the generated surface is high, performing operations in that area will always be more complicated. This is one of the reasons why triangles and, in fact, any shape other than a rectangle should be avoided. If it's a triangle in a relatively flat area where you see that no significant changes will be made, that's fine especially since this software is quite forgiving regarding these topological issues, but that's not true for all software, where triangles and n-gons can create significant problems. But in this case, I don't think so. However, it also depends on the situation we are dealing with. Maybe I'll create a solid here in a slightly different way. Let's try. I'll use the offset command, creating an outer edge that will fill the entire perimeter of the piece. I'll do it this way so you can see that it's good to know various ways to create a solid, because sometimes the most obvious commands might fail and may not give the best result. At this point, notice that we have two surfaces. You can see this if you check the browser. Here are the two bodies. And now, how do we turn this into a solid body? This will become a solid body once I manage to close all these surfaces. That can be done in various ways. One almost automatic way would be through the ruled command or using lofts. We can create lofts in the various sections. And once again, the more complex the geometry, the more work it will require. This situation can also generate another problem. And when I say this situation, I'm specifically referring to the triangle situation. I don't know the quality of the surface in this area. And that's something to check. Not that this is a critical issue for 3D printing, but in models where high quality is required, this is obviously something to verify. The first thing you should do is apply the inspection command that allows you to view the zebra stripes. The zebras are nothing more than a simulation used in the automotive design field. The ceiling of the room is painted black with a series of longitudinal or transverse lights. These lights reflect on the car's shiny paint. And what are you seeing here? Basically, the black is the painted ceiling and the white is the lights. So whenever there are warps, these lights tend to create undulations. Sometimes they can even go out of phase, with a black zone here and there, and in front, a broken white zone. When that happens, it means there's an abrupt transition, like a sharp edge. You can see that something is off here. That was, in fact, expected. But we can go even further by analyzing the curvature here, and it doesn't fail. We indeed have intense curvature fluctuations here. How can you tell? Notice here, you have a gradient that dissipates slightly. And here, you have a gradient that seems to create some kind of vertex, as if the surface is being pinched, pulled at that vertex. Now, imagine this was done through a material removal process, like electroerosion, requiring the creation of molds, etc. 
Since these are high precision processes, all defects will be reproduced by the machine. Let's imagine this was to create the mirror of an automotive headlight. Of course, this can't proceed. It's unacceptable. Knowing these errors in advance and explaining these topological issues without practical context or real-world application would be a waste of time. Now you understand why some precautions are necessary. You must pay attention when creating T-splines, a triangle on a curved surface. It can indeed cause problems. Of course, this isn't as serious for those who use CAD software only for product representation, rendering, or low-precision manufacturing processes, such as some types of 3D printing. With this explanation, I ended up not applying the command I wanted, ruled. Let me do that now. Let's set the boundary condition to that vertex. I think it exceeded for some reason. I believe this has one millimeter. After a quick check to confirm, yes, it's correct. Now, let's also reverse the normals on these surfaces again. And we now have three bodies. We'll use the stitch command. We don't need to select it in the graphical area. We can select it directly in the browser and click OK. By doing this, we unite all the surfaces, turning them into a solid body, just as if we had applied the thicken command. Notice the reticulation occurring here. Let's now try it with thicken. Let's see if I get it right. I'm always looking for the commands because, as I mentioned, I'm not used to using the menus. We'll apply a thicken of one millimeter here. There is indeed a difference between using ruled and thicken. The thicken resulted in a cleaner output, which makes me think I probably won't have significant issues applying a fillet, for example, of 0.5 millimeters, which is half the thickness. Notice, it's not allowing it, likely due to a failure in tangential propagation along the edge. Let's force it and see if it works. Okay, now it does. Now, situations like this arise where the software is trying to resolve a series of issues, but it worked, and that's what matters. There would be many situations, for example, where the fillet doesn't work. What can we do? We can create a loft tangent to the top surface and the bottom surface, and the result will be roughly the same. If you think about it, the fillet seems like a loft, doesn't it? I'd say it's more of a sweep, but if it has a variable radius, then it's a loft. It's an interesting conclusion, not obvious to those who have only been using these applications for a few years and haven't witnessed their evolution. There weren't always so many tools. They emerged to increase productivity, and it's always unfortunate to see useful tools disappear or not be carried over to more modern CAD tools. In this case, it's clear that the fillet is the way to go. It's faster. But if the fillet doesn't work, then it would be necessary to create the fillet manually, which is entirely possible when working with surfaces. But what about those who only know how to work with solids? The fillet failed, and now what? Well, nothing. It stays like this. This is why it's so important to know and master a set of tools, which in the case of fusion, include solids, surfaces, and T-splines, in addition to the possibility of using three forms of creation. I'm leaving out meshes because I consider them a supporting or transitional tool, not a creation tool. I'll wrap up now, and once again, this has gotten too long. But there is indeed much more to say, and believe me, I'm trying to make it shorter. I hope you understood. Next, we'll look at another way to extract geometry, but now completely different, without using T-splines. As always, if you found this content helpful and want to stay updated with similar insights, feel free to subscribe to the channel. There's always more to explore and your support ensures you won't miss any of our future videos.